The subject of today's message is a voice in the wilderness. Now just let me briefly explain. I'm sorry this is not coming direct from the hall. It was all recorded and we also had a lovely solo from our friend Nancy Stockwell and it was perfectly recorded and we checked it out yesterday after the service and lo and behold today it has disappeared. Don't ask me why these things happen. So this is really a rerun of, this, of the message that we had in the Mustard Seed Hall yesterday. And the reading comes from the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 3 and it's about John the Baptist. So we'll just read it. Now in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is the one referred to by Isaiah the prophet when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself had a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem was going out to him and all Judea and all the district around the Jordan. And they were being baptised by him in the Jordan River as they confessed their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not suppose that you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise children up to Abraham. The axe is already laid at the root of the trees, therefore every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. As for me, I baptise you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor and he will gather his wheat into the barn but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable, unquenchable fire. This is God's word. And we pray, we pray that he'll, he will use it for our blessing. Let's just ask God to do that, our Father. This is a wonderful passage of Scripture. It is inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. We pray that it will speak to us today by the Spirit. We ask your blessing upon our meditation upon it. And we pray it will bless it to us. And bless everyone who comes under the sound of it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> if you look up the meaning, the colloquial meaning of a voice in the wilderness, it really refers to a lost cause. Someone trying to support or defend a lost cause. John the Baptist was supporting or suggesting no lost cause. No lost cause. And this story, this passage of scripture with the story in it is a most wonderful story. One of the most wonderful stories in the New Testament. This man, John the Baptist, was a very, very special man. Before he was even conceived in the womb, his father 
Zacharias got a visit from the angel Gabriel, who announced himself as the angel who stands in the presence of God. Gabriel, at this very moment, is standing in the presence of God. From his creation, no doubt, he's been there. And he left that position to visit this priest in Israel to announce to him that he and his wife were going to have a son. And he said some extraordinary things about this child that was going to be born. He actually gave Gabriel, gave the father the name. So he was named by someone, by an angel who came directly from the presence of God. And that same angel told Zacharias that this son that was going to be born would be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in the womb. That is absolutely unique in Scripture. It's not said of any other mortal man. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit in the womb. He was given something, a gift, that was entirely unique in the history of mankind. He was also told that this child that was going to be born would go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. Now, if we go back in Scripture and study the story of Elijah, we find this man, Elijah, had tremendous power in his ministry. He did things that no other prophet could do or did. And he spoke with great power and authority. He faced down a king and told him he was evil and his deeds were evil. He, he contradicted the ruling powers of the day. Such was his power. I know he failed, but then he was just a man. And then the, the, the angel also says to this prophet, this priest, that he would be great in the sight of the Lord. Now, you know, that's a, a remarkable thing. A message from the presence of God to say that a child yet to be born who was not the Lord Jesus Christ would be great in the sight of the Lord. And of course, when we come to the Lord's, the testimony the Lord the Jesus gave of this man, it's f fulfilled and confirmed by Jesus who tells us that there was no one born of woman who was greater. No one born of woman who was greater. Greater than Abraham. Greater than Moses. Greater, greater than Dave, King David or Solomon. All these great men in the New Testament. So he was given this mission as a baby given this mission as a baby. In uh, Luke, it's Gospel chapter 1. Just have a look at it. Luke chapter 1. Verse 76. When his father's mouth was open to speak, he prophesied, he prophesied about his own child, his own son. And this is what he said. You, child, will be called the prophet, the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, 
to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Matthew says here that this was the fulfillment of the prophet Isaiah's word. And it's interesting that this word crying, crying in the wilderness, the actually exact word in the in the original language means shouting shouting John was not popular he was not popular in certain circles first of all he was shouting people don't like a preacher who's shouting but this man was shouting out the most important message that the world had ever heard up to this point nowhere no other prophet had ever proclaimed such an important message and he was shouting it out to all who wanted to hear it. He was not attractive, personally. His message was not attractive. His message was a cry, a shout, a call to repentance. People don't get called, don't get told to repent unless they've got something to repent about. And John made clear that they had plenty to repent about. His, his appearance was not attractive. He was dressed in camel skin. It would be an uncomfortable garment. In fact, the Lord Jesus refers to it. And he says, if you want to see people in soft clothing, go to the palace of kings. What did you go out to see? You went out to see a prophet. Yes, more than a prophet, he says. And Jesus comments on John's dress. What was his diet? His diet was locusts and wild honey. Now, that's a very interesting thing. When food, the types of food that the children of Israel were allowed to eat was pre prescribed in Leviticus, I think it's chapter 11, one of the things that they were allowed to eat, and it's specifically mentioned, was locusts. Now, I have not come across anywhere in the Bible any place, any other person who ate locusts. It was not an attractive diet. Do you know that recently <laughs> these health bars have been invented? And the main substance in them is locusts because people have discovered that they're very rich in protein. 2,000 years ago, John could have told, John the Baptist could have told them that. But he didn't have them made up into nice bars, attractive bars, to crunch on and munch on and enjoy the taste. He ate locusts and wild honey. The wild honey would sweeten the taste of the locusts. Remarkable thing, that. And so... No one has ever been born from, uh, from women who was greater than John. Now, another, men, another fa feature of John's ministry was that he, for, he absolutely refused to speak about himself. He described himself as just a voice. If you could just think of this, there's a king coming and he sends a messenger to loudly proclaim to his, the subjects that are going to receive him. The king is coming. That's what John was saying. The king is coming. Jesus is presented in Matthew's gospel as the king of the Jews. The king who is rightfully the, the man who should reign in Jerusalem. His genealogy, his genealogy in Matthew's gospel makes that clear. And so here was a forerunner of the king. He didn't speak about himself. He only was intent on giving out the message that Christ the Messiah was coming to reign. Well, of course, 
the message was not accepted. And Jesus was never accepted. And Jesus has never reigned over Israel. And he doesn't reign over Israel yet. But the day is coming. So he came, John, the, the gospel writer says, he came as a witness to testify about the light. That's a title of Jesus, the light. John is the only person who is mentioned in prophecy in the Old Testament, apart perhaps from the Antichrist. But no other New Testament figure is specifically mentioned or his service is specifically mentioned in, the, in Old Testament prophecy. The true sign of a preacher or a teacher is that he does not speak about himself. He doesn't tell you where he's been preaching or what he's been doing or how, what success he's had. He points to Jesus. He points to Jesus. The only way he would speak about himself is perhaps to give his testimony or in some self-derisory way. So this passage of scripture we read is one of the passages of scripture that certifies the certainty of God's prophetic word in the Old Testament. Now, look what he says. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. That's a quotation from the 40th chapter of the prophet Isaiah. Now in that, it's interesting to note, when we have, we have a prophecy of the Old Testament repeated in the New, it's very interesting to note the accuracy, the exquisite accuracy of how it's, of how it's repeated in the New Testament. When Jesus came, he said he was here to announce certain things and he missed out one little thing from the prophecy of Isaiah. I think we've mentioned it before in our preaching. The day of vengeance of our God. Because the day of vengeance was not Jesus' remit in his first coming. And here we have something missed out. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says there, to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. But he doesn't say that. The, 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 the Spirit of God does, misses that out in this quotation. You see, in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is presented as the Messiah. Christ. He's presented as the king coming to reign. In John's gospel, what we have is his deity. But his deity is not mentioned. His de John doesn't mention his deity. It's wonderful just to take note of the accuracy of scripture. And so, we have references to John the, John the Baptist in the, in the prophet Isaiah. He's also mentioned very prominently in the writing of Malachi in the Old Testament. And all these things point to the inerrancy of God's word. The fact that when God makes a plan, when God has a, a, has a pathway set out, for the, the uh, introduction of himself and the revelation of himself through Jesus, nothing changes. Nothing changes. You might say it's set in stone. Now, when we, if we just go forward here to another scripture, important scripture, about John, about the, the about the about the Baptist, we find in the Gospel of John what we might describe as John's last testimony. John's Gospel overlapped the Lord's teaching, 
just for a very short time. And bear in mind, there were two men who were very, very close in age. John was just very slightly older than the Lord. You see pictures of John the Baptist by artists and he's portrayed as an old man. He was not an old man. He was a young man. He was a young man. He would be only in his very early 30s, a young, strong man. And uh, we have here in John, in the, the Gospel of John, in chapter 3, and it tells us here, and this is the words of John the Baptist. It's wonderful we actually get the words of John the Baptist. We've got the words of John the Baptist calling for repentance in chapter 3 of Matthew's Gospel. Here we have the testimony of John the Baptist relating to the Lord Jesus Christ in the, the, uh, the third chapter of John's Gospel. And this is what he says. You yourselves, he says in verse 27 of that chapter, a man can do nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been, has been filled, has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. That was John's conviction. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies and no one receives his testimony. He who has received this testimony, his testimony, has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, examining this passage of Scripture here, I, it's my belief that John's testimony stops there, and the next two verses are comments of the Holy Spirit of God imparted to John the Apostle. He goes on here. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. John the Baptist did not belong to the church, what we know as the church. The church is a body of people who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and come to that belief um, by repentance and faith in Christ. And coming to that, that belief, to believe on Jesus, they are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that gift remains with them from that moment through death into a life beyond. These are the people who form part of Christ's church. John was a prophet of the Old Testament. He was a prophet of Israel. He describes himself, he describes himself as the friend of the bridegroom. That's a notable expression. He's the friend of the bridegroom. He's not, he doesn't belong to the bride. 
So, uniquely as an Old Testament saint, an Old Testament prophet, we noticed that in the very womb of his mother, he received the gift of the Spirit. No one else is spoken of in the Old Testament as having been indwelt permanently by the Spirit of God. You look at the record of the Old Testament and people were filled with the Spirit or empowered with the Spirit from time to time. But but John, uniquely, the Spirit of God came to take up residence with him, within him, in the womb. And so, this passage of Scripture in John's Gospel, chapter 3, is really remarkable because we find out, and it's because, of, I believe, it's because he was indwelt by the Spirit of God, although not part of the church. He was indwelt by the Spirit of God. It was revealed to him certain things. Now, what do I mean by that? First of all, he says, I am not the Christ. His powerful, his preaching was powerful. Crowds were coming to see him. Crowds were coming out of the cities to the wilderness. He wasn't very accessible, but the Spirit of God was moving people to come and hear him preach, and that included the religious intelligentsia who thought they knew better, who prided themselves on their knowledge. And he wasn't very well pleased with them because, because of the fact that the Spirit of God was indwelling him, he had a perception above anybody else and he knew that they were fake, they were false. He, he, he more or less told them, you're, you're not repentant. You're not repentant. So he, then he starts to say this, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. You don't get the teaching of the bride and the bridegroom developed in the Old Testament. There are references to it. There are, there are uh, hidden references to it. Isaac, uh, for example, sending his, his servant to get a bride. Uh, it's, a, it's a type, a shadow of what was to come in the, the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavenly man getting his bride. And then, of course, we have references to the bride and the bridegroom in the Song of Songs. But the truth of the church as the bride of Christ awaited the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost and really awaited the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And that's another remarkable thing because the Apostle Paul, who was given that ministry, to develop and to teach that we have today the the church as the bride of Christ, he also tells us he was set apart from his mother's womb. He didn't have have an early uh, career like John the Baptist. He was fighting against the Lord Jesus Christ. He was persecuting the people of God. He didn't receive the Spirit in his mother's womb. He was set apart from his mother's womb, but he didn't receive the Spirit until he himself was converted on the Damascus Road and came to know know the Lord Jesus Christ. Who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus. Now, to come back to our scripture in John, John, the third of John, he says, The friend of the bridegroom who stands in here rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine, this joy of mine has been made full. The picture we have in scripture of John the Baptist 
is not really the picture of a joyful man. But there was no joy like the joy that John the Baptist had to realise after he had delivered his message and to see Jesus, he exclaimed, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. What was the, 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 the revelation of light given to this man, John the Baptist, that he was not permitted to teach or to preach. He refers to these things. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, he testifies. And John prophetically says, and no one receives his testimony. John knew by the Spirit of God that Jesus was going to be rejected. But that didn't dishearten him. His joy was full. And he says, He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. That's everybody, I understand that. That's people who believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. We accept the testimony that God has given us in Christ. And it says here, has set his seal to this, that God is true. That truth is sealed in the believer's heart. One and another might go astray, and that's very sad. But that truth, once set there, once sealed by God, once sealed by God, we're told that when we believe, God seals us with the Holy Spirit. I believe that's what John's referring to here. And he says, for who, he whom God has sent speaks the word of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. There's false teaching going on that after a person is converted, he's got to wait on some, something that people describe as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit when we believe. That's the truth. We may have wonderful experiences. The Spirit of God may fill us with the impressions of the glory of Christ and light up our life and light up our path and send us forth on the Christian pathway of rejoicing. But God does not give his Spirit by measure. That's what John's teaching here and preaching. He's looking forward to Pentecost. That's a wonderful thing. This man who is his public persona was a rough, shouting <laughs> individual, unattractive perhaps in his personal appearance and certainly unattractive to guilty sinners in his message. Yet he's full of joy. He says, my, this, this joy of mine has been made full. And then the Spirit comments and John, write, the Apostle, writes down, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Where did he get that? He got it from the mouth of he got it from the mouth of Jesus. Jesus said that, that the Father had given all things into his hand. So John the John the, the, the writer of the gospel is quoting Jesus. And then we have the gospel. We have the gospel. And I would say to everyone who's listening to this message today, listen to the words of John chapter 3 and verse 36. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life 
but the wrath of God abides in him. The Spirit of God is confirming the preaching of John the Baptist. He said to the, the, the religious people, he said to the religious people, who has, formed, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? The message of Jesus is a message of love. The message of Jesus is a message of forgiveness. The message of Jesus is a, a message of redemption. The message of Jesus is the pathway, the only pathway to eternal life. We get on that pathway by repentance. The Spirit of God, mission in the world, is to convict men of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. We get on the pathway to eternal life. We take the first step in repentance. And then, by embracing the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour, the one who died on the cross, the one who bore our sins in his own body on the tree, the one who suffered at the hands of God, was made sin by his own Father, who became sin, who died, whose blood was shed as the witness to a work complete, who cried out, it is finished. By trusting in that Saviour, you and I have eternal life. By no other way can we have it. The warning is clear at the end of that verse. The warning is clear. And we, the preacher cannot avoid delivering the message. The alternative is to face the wrath of God. May that not be the portion of anyone listening to this word today. And may God bless the word. Amen.